So let's pray before we begin. God, we thank you for giving us this opportunity to talk and engage in a conversation that hopefully will bring us closer to you and to each other. We ask for your presence, your spirit to bring truth and love as we uh, listen to each other and as we hope to understand better who you are and who you're calling us to be. Thank you for all of the people who are here and for the interest and for the desire to be more faithful. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. So I'm going to tell you what tonight is not going to be. We're not going to talk about what is happening right now with the Methodist Church. We don't know. That's going to be one of the later sessions. Um, so all of those conversations about this plan or the other plan, I think we're going to leave that for the next session because even in the next session we're not going to be quite sure of what that's going to be. So we're not going to talk about that. Um, this is not going to be also, uh, there's one way, correct way to read the Bible and then there's another way and you're right and I'm wrong and we're going to have a debate about who's right and who, we're not going to have a debate. We're going to have like a general conversation about the topic of human sexuality as much as we can in one hour, uh, having a conversation with people. I'm gonna, I want to make room for you to ask questions. So we're going to have this conversation in that sense. It's the first one of several we're going to have, but tonight in particular, I want to talk to you more about kind of like a continuation of the, the CCPC meeting that we had, but just with more, some, a few specific things that I think it might be worth it for us to go through. Does that make sense? So the place where I want to start is maybe the place where Hawaii read the scriptures so that I can share with you and from there we can then begin to have the conversation. Is that okay? Um, have any of you uh, heard or know the word hermeneutics? Have you heard that before? Hermeneutics. Okay. Hermeneutics is the way we interpret the Bible. That's the way we read and interpret the Bible. So, we are Methodists, we're Wesleyan, we are descendants of John and Charles Wesley. That means that as, in theory, we all as Methodists have a hermeneutical approach to the scriptures. We have a, a frame with, uh, with the one way we began to read the scripture. And it was mentioned at the session on Sunday, it's called the quadrilateral, right? It has four, four parts in the way we read the Bible. It begins, and I'm just going to write it here for those of you who like to think of it. It begins with scripture. It begins with scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. So here's, this is how, when we begin to read the Bible, or when we want to find a frame for life, this is, this is the, the filter that we use, and this is how we, we live our life, and this is how we discern life, this is how we grow in God, this is how we treat each other, this is the order of how we make decisions. We begin with scripture, number one. Uh, we are uh, people who, the scripture is at the center of everything that we do. That's where we begin. So when we have questions about faith, about God, about humanity, we go to the scriptures. Then, as a second place for us to understand what the scriptures are saying, we go to tradition, which is the way that people in the church have interpreted the Bible for thousands of years. We go and listen to and read and listen to how they uh, interpreted the scriptures that we're reading and understood the, the questions that we have. We go to the tradition because one of the things that we have to acknowledge is that um, 
a lot of the questions that we have, people had it before us. Okay, so we're not the only ones struggling with certain issues. So we go to the tradition to see how how they understood and interpreted all those things. Then the next part is reason. Uh, we believe that God has given us human understanding to, to process things and to see the world and that we are part of a collective, um, you know, reason of understanding the world. And so we use our reason also as another tool to help us to, to make it better, to understand the world, and to just keep moving in that understanding of who God is. So we use reason. And then, finally, when all of those things um, were still undecided, we go to experience. We go to that place again, and um, we look at people who are going through the same issues that we are, and we talk to them to see how how they did it. You know how how they how they managed the situation, how how they were able to move forward, to stay together. You know all those things. So we use experience. Okay. So this is our frame of reference as Methodists. This is one of the contributions that John Wesley did to to the world that we get to have this process where we not just whatever we think or whatever we want or whatever we feel. There is a process that we all go through. It's called the quadrilateral, so that helps us to have a foundation for any conversations that we have. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to share with you another word. Um, inductive method. Have you heard that word? Yeah. Can you write in black? Inductive. Okay, sorry. I'm going to let you go. Oh, no. Inductive method. This is, um, when I read the Bible, I use the inductive method, which means that I just don't look at one verse but I look at the whole book to understand what that verse is all about. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It takes into account the whole picture of that particular passage so that we don't pick and choose certain things and then we just go from there. Like I pick one verse and that's the verse that I'm only going to use and I forget about the rest. Yes? Yeah. So the inductive method invites all of you, but that's how I read it. Uh, you read the scripture in context. You read the scripture not just in the sociological context, but you read it in the context of the chapter, and you read it in the context of the book. You, you try to see where this particular verse fits in the story that God is trying to teach us, that the, the author of the book is trying to tell us, so that I can have a better view, a larger view, a more comprehensive view of that particular passage. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that again, uh, when I'm trying to, you know, when when I'm trying to, when I'm preparing a sermon, uh, I not only prepare by reading that particular passage or verse. You have to go to, you know, you know the whole story. You know, the Gospel of Luke. You know, the Gospel of Luke, for example, is the one that is all about including the people who are not part of the group. That's the tone of the Gospel of Luke. So every time you read a scripture, then you realize that what we're trying to learn besides the story is a larger story of in inclusion, right? And so that forces you to have like a mi microscope. You know, you, you like a microscope, you're looking at with a microscope to that passage, but then you also do the telescope where you go back so that you can see the whole picture. <clears throat> Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. And um, I think, again, for the way I uh, try to communicate uh, in my sermon, but also in the way I relate to you, even in my personal life, that's also the way I, I read the scripture. Um, because if, 
if we begin, from my perspective, once we begin to take just one verse at a time and then we take it from here and then we don't read the context, then we're going to miss a lot of the story and the purpose and the interpretation of the passage. All right? There's nothing wrong with um, wanting to have a Bible study in a passage. It used to be uh, that in the, you know, the famous preachers, you know, those uh, from England in the 1800s, the most famous, John Bunyan, no, John Bunyan. There's this preacher, Baptist preacher, that he will preach a two-hour sermon on one word from one verse. That's what they would do. They will have a two-hour sermon just using one word of that verse. That's great. But you also have to look at the whole picture to understand the context. Otherwise, we're going to get in trouble, not just with sexuality, but with everything. We're going to get in trouble when it comes to um, economics, race, uh, justice, compassion. Um, we're going to begin to pick and choose slavery. All of those things we're going to begin to, to have one way of looking at the, you know, very small, short-sighted, I would say, way of looking at the whole narrative of the scriptures, which is to tell us a larger story. So does that make any sense? Uh -huh. Yeah? OK. So let me begin just then in a very large sense with the book of Genesis. OK? Um, the book of Genesis tells us the story, the creation story. In fact, we, we are kind of doing a little bit of that right now at church. We'll be talking about we being part of this sacred uh, creation, sacred beauty that God has made, has made all of us, the creation, in such a way that all of us reflect God's love. And so there are many things you may remember. You know, God created the world in six days, and then on the seventh day, God rested. You can recall the creation of, of the animals, the creation of the sea, of, you know, the separation between light and, and the day and the night, all of those things. You may remember that from your Sunday school days. But I think for me, there's the, the thing that stands out about the creation story is that all that beautiful poetic description is this idea that when God created us, God made all of us good. Okay? This is not me putting words into the passage. Every time God created something, yes, God yes. said that it was good. good. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. <clears throat> and let me just say that from the beginning, uh, the creation story was a very uh, countercultural understanding of who God is for the people, in, even in their time. Because when you look at the, at, the, at the neighbors that were living around the people of Israel, and you look at the story of their myths and their gods and their religions, you will know and you'll realize that a lot of those religions, um, humanity, in the best case scenario, was an accident. Humanity came out as an accident, or it was humanity was a punishment. There was. Uh, an affair between these two gods, and out of those two gods who had an affair, we were created. That's humanity. So it was this understanding, a really poor view of humanity, that we were meant, you know, that, that the gods were going to be mad at us, that we had to do certain things for, for the god to not be angry at us, so we had to do all sorts of things, and if we didn't do those things, we were going to be destroyed and cursed. Okay? So you, you get that sense that humanity that we were all awful you know we, we were, were like we're not wanted we're not good but then you go to the Hebrew scripture and you begin from this place of goodness okay so we are all created with goodness within us that God wanted us to reflect that love and that goodness that co-creation that we all get to do and uh, and from that that's the place where I begin my understanding of who God is and humanity. Now, let me go back to the creation story. If you look at the naming of all the things that were created, you will see that um, it was created the heavens and the earth, right? And it was the night and the day, the land and the sea. You remember that, right? I'm not making that up, no, right? No. 
So, <coughs> but when we think about those things, so for example, when we think about night and day, is night and day everything that there is? Or there is, um, what else is there between the morning and the nights? Mm -hmm. What is there? Right? Yeah, right. So, 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 so there's not just what this or that. No. We don't go from sun to darkness, right? There is a, there's all this spectrum of things that are in between all of those, right? Mm -hmm. And so, it's a non-binary. I mean, it's they're doublets. That's what they call it, doublets. But they're 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 non-binary. That's what I'm trying to say. There's not just th this and that. That's it. There's something. There's a lot in between these two examples, right? Mm -hmm. And so, when we think about all those things, I think we, we ha I have to tell you. you Maybe go back to my notes and go back to seminary for a little bit just to explain this in a way that you can understand me. But we have to think about it in the sense that there is not just it's not a dualistic world that we live in, okay? There's a lot of things in between. Uh, Adam Hamilton, you know Adam Hamilton, wrote a book a few years ago called Gray, or something, something about gray. Because there's a lot of gray in our lives. It's not just black and white, there are, there's, there's gray. And so, when we live in a world that is binary, it is a very difficult world to live in because there will be times when the world is not black and white. And that's when we, I would say, can get in trouble. Because then if we think that we live in a world that is black and white, then we're going to begin to interpret a God that is more, you're either right or you're completely wrong. And then you, you begin to get into this punitive, angry God that we want to please. And if you're not pleasing God, then you're really in a, in, a, in a place where there's no grace. Because really the gray, grace covers the, grace covers the gray. The places where we fail, the places where we're not perfect, where we need help. That's what grace is for. Okay? So again, I'm just trying to tell you where I'm coming from in terms of how I begin to see um, the larger understanding of the scriptures. So... So when it comes to sexuality, I think that, that one of the things that we, we have done and that I have had to retrain myself is that many times we begin from, we, we begin to interpret the scriptures from an anthropological perspective, which means we begin with the human being. And so when you begin with the human being, again, we, we're going to get in trouble because depending on who you talk to, there are different levels of how to be righteous. We all have different, sometimes, depending on how you were taught, we have different levels of righteousness. And I'll give you an example. Um, and I mentioned this before. When I was little, I was taught by my grandmother that the only way to pray was for me to close my eyes and squeeze my eyes really hard. <laughs> because if that was the only way God was going to listen to me. Okay, I had to close my eyes and really pray, and then that, but if I opened my eyes, or if I didn't really was like hurting myself when I was praying, God was not gonna listen to me. And she said that to me because I didn't wanna go to bed, and we would pray always before bed. And that was the only way I would just stop running around and jumping around, right? Um, now, if I had carried that understanding to all of you, <laughs> that that's the only way God's going to listen to your prayers, right? That would be problematic, to say the least. And so, what I'm trying to say is that when we begin to interpret the scriptures from something that we learn from somebody else, placing it on ourselves, it's going to be hard really to get to see the whole picture of who God is. And so we began to read the scriptures from an inductive method perspective where we see one verse and the whole story 
but most importantly, we begin with God's intention. And God's intention is that we are all good in that God created out of love. God is love. God cannot help it. God is love. So everything that God creates is out of love. And so if we begin with that understanding, and if we begin to see each other with that understanding, then we will understand that people who are different from me, they're not wrong, even though they might be different from me. Because they were still created in God's image. And so that's the main foundation. So again, when it comes to sexuality, um, that is also the place where I begin. Sexuality uh, is a large spectrum. It's not just this or that. There's a, there's a big spectrum in between what we call normal, whatever that is. God calls it diversity. There is diversity. We're all diverse. And uh, this is the place where we begin, to begin that conversation from that place of goodness. Does that make sense? Does this elicit any questions for you before I keep going? Where does sin come into that? Like I'll stop repeating. What where does the concept of sin enters into all of this? Or how do we see that becoming part of the spectrum of of sin? Again, let's for a moment separate sexuality, okay? I'm talking about sin. Let's let's take don't what I'm gonna say don't connect it to sexuality. Okay? Um, sin is our separation from God. It is are going on our separate way from God, what God is inviting us to do, okay? So, God has love and compassion and all those things available to all of us, but sometimes we decide to do our own thing for many different reasons. And we all have that independent spirit and so in our independent spirits, we walk away from the goodness. And once we walk away from that goodness, we, uh, we can hurt ourselves or we can hurt others. And so sin comes in that freedom that we have, that God gives us, to not be robots who are programmed to always do and not think and not embrace the good way of God. But, um, but once we begin to walk, again, that's why the faith journey, um, it has ups and downs, not just because life is complicated, but because we are complicated. We have contradictory desires. We want to do what's right. But we're selfish. We, we want to be kind. But we have a temper, you know. So, and, and that's where we we have to um, sin becomes that place where we walk in a different direction. Okay. Again, I'm not. That's not sexuality right now. Because we're gonna get to that. But that's just the concept of sin. Okay. Now, as we begin to move through, and again, it's, it's really hard to summarize the entire scriptures. You know, there are so many different ways that you can attack this. And so I don't want you to, to think that this is the only way, but this is the way I'm, I'm, I'm doing it tonight. So as you see then in the Hebrew Scriptures, in the Old Testament, then you begin to see the creation of this new faith community who are trying to learn how to love God and how, how to express that love to God and to each other. The Ten Commandments come, and, and what that is, is God then makes a covenant with the people of Israel that um, 
basically that this covenant is going to be a covenant of love. And then God begins to give a lot of different rules about how they're going to live together, how they're going to do things together, what they can eat, what they cannot eat, what they can wear, what they cannot wear, when they're going to worship, when they cannot worship, when they're going to work, when they're not going to work, how they're going to treat the person who injured them, how are they going to um, respond to the injustice. So you see, you begin to see all these rules, and, and, and some of them um, are really interesting, um, and we look back, and right now we look back and they're like, wow, that's really, you know, that's um, interesting. But, but God is setting boundaries of behavior because they're, they're having this covenant that it needs to be really, the whole point of it is that it's going to lead people to love God. And so that's then where we begin to, to have this uh, conversation about covenant and um, idolatry. We begin to have conversations about idolatry, you know, where God is, God wants them to be faithful. Um, then we begin to have these conversations about adultery, where again, God, the covenant is all about faithfulness and idolatry and staying within the boundaries of that covenant so that it will be a monogamous relationship. We're moving from a polygamy, a lot of gods. We are moving from a polygamy where a man will have several wives, we're moving to a place where it's a monogamy. It's a one-on-one, -on -one. it's a relation, it's a covenant that has to be respected, that has to be embraced. You have to live within the boundaries of that covenant of love so that you can then really begin to show um, this love and this new way of being people of faith. And so, so then, but you remember, you're living on, 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 among people who don't have a clue of this kind of new way of being people of faith, and they have different uh, understandings, and so um, they began to, to be very clear about what they should not be doing, like you should not be doing these things, and again, so it is in that context that then you, you begin to get uh, this conversation about uh, marriage, and sexuality, but it is all in the context of um, monogamy, it is in the context of faithfulness. It doesn't have necessarily anything to do with sexuality, if that makes any sense. It is about adultery. It is about, and I can give you the Hebrew words, I can give you the, the, the Greek words, we can get into that if you want, but really the bottom line that it really what the, what the scriptures are talking about is about a covenantal relationship between adults that God that's what God <coughs> wants for all of us it's not about sexuality sexuality it's about sexuality out of the boundaries of that covenant of faithfulness and so that's where you get now into the verses that you probably have heard that we that we use sometimes to to, to talk about homosexuality. Now, before we get there, let me add now let me add a new dimension to the hermeneutics. So not only we have these steps that we take when we read the scriptures and how we interpret the scripture, but I think at the center of all of this, the hermeneutic that really um, affects the way we need to read the scripture is Jesus. Okay? We read the scripture through the eyes of Jesus. Okay? Which, in many ways, raises things to a very high level from even if you stay with it you know it is the same but in a very practical way we see in Jesus 
this way of living faith, interpreting the scriptures, and living the scriptures. And so we, when we read the Bible, when we read the scriptures, it's not only what I like or what I want or what I think. We also have to bring Jesus into interpretation. Okay? Which in many cases makes it more complicated because Jesus calls us to do things that we don't want to do, such as not only pray for your enemy, but love your enemy. Right? Right. <laughs> Jesus then begins to tell us to do things that we as humans don't like. Basically, one way to see it is that Jesus invites us to not be so tribal. You know, we like our tribe, but the tribe is bigger than you think. You have to open the tribe to all the people. And so that's really hard, no matter it can be for many that it's not just sexuality, it's all different issues that we have with people. So it's an expansion of that vision of who God is. So when you read the scriptures, I really hope that you're reading them with this new filter that Jesus has given us to understand who we are. Okay? Okay. I'm going to stop there. I would like to hear at least some conversation about this so far. Well, I just think the first is love thy neighbor. Mm -hmm. Now, in Jesus' time, who is my neighbor today? I think the whole world is my neighbor because I travel around, I see people, I interact with people every day from months all over the world. That's my neighbor. So. Even that concept is love thy neighbor. That means to me, everybody. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I can handle that one better than I can handle love my enemies. Mm -hmm. I have a little trouble with that. First you be the You're not the part. only one. <laughs> well, exactly right. Yeah. yeah. It's good when I think about the whole world, but now let's just... Specifically a person, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the other look at that is that you're... <clears throat> enemy may actually be your neighbor. Well, that's what I just said. He might be. Maybe my neighbor next door, I'm, he's my enemy. <laughs> I don't know. It seems so simple, but when, when I'm trying to live it, sometimes I find it more difficult. I guess that means you're mortal. You know? <laughs> It seems the conundrum we've gotten into with part of the current discussions, it seems to me, is that we've kind of superseded in contemporary times Wesley's quadrilateral with a different way of thinking entirely, which is more ideological rationalization, which is that people reach a conclusion about a particular belief they have, and then they begin to choose scripture, tradition, and sometimes even the elements of their own experience which justifies their beliefs. And it accounts, in my judgment, for a lot of the visions we find uh, in society as a whole, because we selectively reinforce constantly our previously held beliefs. And nowadays, in, uh, we're even able to select news and other types of sources that continuously reinforce those kinds of beliefs. So we are able to selectively see, hear, and actually feel constantly reinforced in our priests and thieves' conclusions. To some extent, uh, I, and again, as I get older, I sometimes think the only way that some of these beliefs will be extinguished is with the death of those who hold them. That is, as this generation passes away, right. and perhaps things will begin to change a little bit, because the ideological rationalizations that accompany some of this, and frankly intelligent people, smart people, are even better able to pick and choose the arguments and rationalizations so they can find in the scripture. And
and they can find in the Old and New Testament because once you get beyond uh, the creation story, you have to immediately go to Eden. And once you go to Eden, you go to the fall. And once you go to the fall, you begin to talk about sin. And you begin to talk about how we all fall short. Again, people will pick and choose because the Bible is a very diverse book. And we've used it as United Methodists to divide the church several times in the past. And it looks like we're beginning to assemble our arguments in order to justify the same sort of conclusions that actually I thought we'd healed a couple generations ago, but it doesn't seem to be where we're at right today. Yeah, uh, Gary, in, in along that vein, uh, and looking at context, okay, GAL we call it contextual sophistication. And, and in the years that I taught disciple Bible study, we looked at scripture from not just the world, what's in, what's in scripture or Bible passage. We looked at it also from the geopolitical, social, economic time in which they were written. Mm -hmm. And if you can ask Steve Wiseman about this, much of the uh, the early books of the Bible and the evening to the second, first and second kings were not written until the Babylonian exile for the purpose of explaining to the Jews where they came from and what their God is all about. Um, and it was also a way to explain why they wouldn't, why first the, uh, the Assyrians and then the Babylonians actually conquered Israel. Okay, why? Their sin. But How did God, at, God's so, chosen people get beat, right? <laughs> If you look at that, if you look at from that context, so when you study the Bible, you get a better feeling for why it was written that way. And you know, you're looking at going back also looking at the laws, the early Jewish laws, Leviticus, whatever. Those were passed down, written for a people who had just been over 400 years in a pagan society with no religious upbringing or background, only an ethnic understanding. So in order to form a civilized community in the Promised Land, you had to have these strict laws to get them settled in and to, so that they can live together and live, uh, have healthy eating habits, okay? So that, so that this society can get can move along. So you really have to look at, at this type of context when, when viewing um, scripture. And uh, you mentioned, I'm going to have to go up to quadrilateral up there. Scripture, tradition, recent experience. Depends on which emphasis you put, apply to one of those legs of the quadrilateral is where you're going to go with your belief. Mm -hmm. But as far as the church tradition is concerned, there is evidence that that tradition has been overturned every 500 years. Or less. And we, and the last time it was overturned was during the Reformation 500 years ago. Mm -hmm. Let's think about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah? It seems to me what it comes down to is, is, is basic thing. Is, you know, there are you can either have a lot of rules to go by, or you can have a relationship with God. And I think there are times that churches get wrapped up in the religious part of rules and regulations, that you have to do this, you have to do that, you want to do this, you got to do that, versus focusing on their relationship with God, and that's supposed to be what's important. Um, because as you pointed out in the beginning of this discussion, is that when you get separated from God, that's where the sin begins, you know, and that's what you don't want, you know, to have happen. Mm -hmm. But through interpreting all the rules and regulations is oftentimes how we get that separation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I think we also don't. I think we also don't name our teachings often as rules and regulations, but in talking about how to have a relationship with God, we're also following a set of rules, right? We're, all, we're following 
love thy neighbor, we're following read your Bible, we're following pray on your own and in community. We're following, like we, we have this set of rules, but we don't often talk about them as rules. And so I think sometimes the, like, the separation between those who read the Bible more from a traditional lens and those who read it more from a progressive lens, like, there's often the debate that, like, well, those who read it from a progressive lens don't have rules. And it's like, no, actually, I have just as many rules, maybe more rules than you do. I, we just have different, we have a different set of rules, right? And we have, like, a different set of rules because we're coming about from a different starting point. Yeah. And tradition is important. I mean, right now, where's the schism? It's between the African countries, the Orient. They look at it one way. We look at it a totally different way based on our tradition. So it's hard to say which one is right, which one is, you know, neither one is right or wrong. It's just different. Well, again, I think going back to the hermeneutics, um, you know, the way we, I mean, in some ways it's like our starting point and our ending point is love, right? And, um, and just the understanding that, you know, John Wesley, one of the things that he also, a legacy that he left, not because he created it, but the way he explained it is, we as Christians are on a journey toward perfection, okay? So we are on a journey to grow all the time. We are on a journey to be more Christ-like. No one has arrived. We're always learning and growing and moving forward. That is, that's, that's the whole idea of holiness. Holiness is our loving more God and our neighbor. And so we keep hopefully advancing in that understanding and in our, in our journey for, to, to love others. And so right now, we are at that place where uh, bottom line, God calls us to love. And again, not just the sexuality discrepancy, but you know that the, even the person that doesn't agree with me, you know, and how can we still be in relationship with each other, even though we disagree with each other, right? How can we listen to each other, and how can we grow um, with each other and from each other? So it is th that's really again we're, we're not gonna get into the. The potential Methodist debacle, <laughs> but I, I, I want to keep it at the center where we are at a, at a local personal level of how we are all being challenged to expand that understanding of what love is. Um, and you know, and one thing that um, I want to also say is that you know, when, um, when we look at Jesus, um, we we also have to realize that Jesus, Jesus actually had an agenda. <laughs> you know, the agenda was the kingdom of God. I'm gonna, the kingdom of God is here. But, uh, but Jesus did not focus on the whole. You know, he was focusing on something. In, not that not it wasn't important, but Jesus was focusing on. on on, on this idea of again coming to the people of Israel and then how that expanded to all of us. How God had come not just to save the people of Israel, but came to save all of us. And so on his journey, we, I mean, we look at what he, we need to see how he was constantly challenging the religious institutions. We have to see that. He was always challenging and making the religious people upset about the changes that, that, that he was bringing and how he became more interested in, um, in, the, in the people who were at the margins, the people who were not part of the, of the main group, how he was really began to gravitate to those places that were on the edges to bring them in. I mean, the parable of the the 99 sheep, right, that he left, the 
99 to go for one. Mm -hmm. Again, it's not, it was not just a, a story, a pretty story. It was really the story of his ministry and, I would say, our calling that we are. And, and so, when it comes to this conversation about sexuality, we we have to realize that. Um, You know, there was this book, What Would Jesus Do? You know, mm -hmm. like, I think that that's part of the question, right? Mm -hmm. Why would, how would, what would Jesus do? And, and, and again, coming from this understanding that, you know, again, we are learning. Science is also an important fact in what we are learning about sexuality. Okay? It is, it is. We, we have to take into account that we have, you know, talk about reason. We have more information than we had before to understand things better. Mm -hmm. And and to expand our understanding, you know, of how God is calling us to be people of love. And again, I want to go back to the centrality of this when, um, when the scriptures really are talking about a sexual perversion, really what they're talking about is a breaking of the covenant. Someone, I'm just going to be very plain, someone who's sleeping around. Someone who is a predator. Someone who is abusing, sexually abusing people. That's really the bottom line of those sexual perversion um, that we see. It's, it's, it's not about the relationship between people of the same sex, it's about the abuse of that relationship, the breaking of the covenant that really is the focus. And so I, I, I just want you to begin to think about that as, again, when I go back to Genesis and we, we have this conversation, but it's, it's night and day, but there's a lot of things between night and day. And God created it all. Okay, we, we need to then potentially begin to change the way we understand sexuality, at least in this case. Now, it's, I would say it's not easy because we've been taught this for over what, 2,000 years or more? I don't know how long it's been, or more actually, you know, that our, our, our heritage has been that, but that doesn't mean we can't be open to the Holy Spirit to lead us in a new direction. And so, 750. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. Sorry, no, I can't even leave. I tried to leave work as early as I could. Sorry, sorry. Um, hi, for people who don't know me, I'm Deb. Um, my She's husband. our Lumi! Yeah, my husband and I officially Just joined. joined us. Yeah, uh, we've, been, yeah. we've been trying to come as much as we could, you know, as little kids. Uh, it's been a struggle. Um, but this has actually been a topic in our house for years. Um, mm -hmm. My husband and I both went to Christian colleges, and this was one of those big topics at, um, you know, we had chapel three to five times a week, depending on the school and how many of the chapels we were going to. Um, you know, we went through so many biblical studies classes and all that. And this was a very big topic at both of our schools because it, there are so many different perspectives on it from people who have spent decades studying scripture. Um, and so my husband and I kind of came at this from different perspectives initially and, and uh, spent some time. And over the last few years, he sort of coalesced on it. But, uh, you know, God is so faithful through his word, right? Like. There are consistencies over and over and over. You're talking about how many times we are seeing stories of Jesus reaching out to the marginalized. It's because it's important. So he tells us over and over and over in different voices in different ways so you can reach whoever's listening. No, like, really, listen, this is important. But then on this subject, there there's really so few. There's so few references. Um, you know, there's like the, uh, there's the purity codes, and then there's a handful of things in the New Testament and those are using kind of different words. I don't know if you've gotten into all that because again, I'm this. But like, like the Greek in 1 Corinthians is what people keep on going back to. But like, we've only been using that word as homosexual since the 40s, the 1940s. So like, 
that's kind of, was again, it always was more of a different kind of perversion. And then that was written by Paul, who was the same one who also authored Galatians, right? And so like the same person. And in Galatians 3, you see the whole line of, uh, there is no Jew more Jew, there is no Gentile, there is no male, there is no female. So if gender is not that important, then how can who you're with also be? Um, it's the same author talking in the same time period. At the same time that 1 Corinthians, that was, we look contextually, that historical, which you're, you're, you're talking about there, uh, that most recent Caesar was awful and used his power in those kind of ways, especially in the bedroom. Um, it was a very wrong thing to do at the time. Um, and so that writer, that, that, that letter to Corinthians, I mean, it's just, if there's, if there's going to be so many questions about it over and over again, if it's not something that's repeated over and over and clear again, then at least in our house, we don't see how it's at least a salvation. It, it can't be a salvation issue. And if it's not that, <coughs> You know, what is it? Yeah, and you know, um, that this conversation is we have to we so we also have to be honest with ourselves that we do pick scriptures. Mm -hmm. Let's just be honest. We all do pick out scriptures. We all do. Sometimes we do it unintentionally, and sometimes we do it intentionally. And I think that we just have to be honest about that because, um, you know, I am, uh, for example, married to, uh, to my wife who happens to be a pastor. And Paul is very clear at some points. I mean, if we want to be really hardcore, Paul says that women should not be teaching in the church. I mean, that's, do we agree with that? Yes. No, no, but I'm just telling you, I'm just saying. So, so are we, so let me just, let me just have an argument with you. In my head. It's a rhetorical argument. So, do we believe that God selected this group of people to be less than this other group of people? No. Do we? Well, it was rhetorical. You're not supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I don't not know. With this group. I don't know that I want your answers. Oh, there. <laughs> no, no, I'm just, I'm just going through the, through the, the, like again, just this process, kind of like the, you know, the, the quadrilateral, where we begin to discern things and realize that. I mean, we have come to a place where, I know my wife has been called by God to be a pastor. I know that Chelsea has been called to be a pastor. If we were to follow Paul's rules, women should not be chairs of committee, you know, the chairing committees here at our church. Uh, but do I think that's right? No. Do you think that's right? And so, again, I just want you to, you know, we, we, um, all I'm saying is that sometimes we suspend those rules when it comes to things that we're uncomfortable with. And we need to just ask the question, why are we uncomfortable with this? Because again, I, I do believe that you look at the scripture from the inductive method and you see that I don't believe that God created a group of people who were condemned to be miserable and excluded and just because of who they are. I, I don't believe. In fact, one of the main theological fights that John Wesley had with people of his time was with the Calvinist, okay? Who said, there is this small group of people who are gonna go to heaven, and the other one is gonna go to hell no matter what you do. So don't even try. And if you're part of the elected, do whatever you want, you're gonna make it to heaven anyway. Yeah. And John Wesley said, excuse me? <laughs> God's grace is for all. Now, if we believe that for ourselves, why don't we see that in the rest of creation? And I think that that's something for us to, to think about and pray about um, because, um, you know, sometimes 
we say, well, if the Bible says it, that settles it. Are you sure? Because it also talks about stoning, not the one you think you I'm <laughs> getting stoned, but like really with, with rocks. And you're not supposed to combine fabrics of what you're wearing. And uh, if your children disobey you, you're supposed to stone them. I just want, I just want us to... Um, we are on this journey together to grow again into a place where we keep loving more. And these are difficult times. You know, something very interesting about Sunday night, for those of you who were there, you know, it's interesting because the progressives and the conservatives are making the same arguments. Mm -hmm. And here's the, the argument that they make. Young people don't come to church because you are very conservative, or young people don't come to church because you're too liberal. Are we loving the young tired. people? Are we just loving the young? No, no. Are we loving the young people regardless of conservative or progressive? Should right. We should be. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't matter. We we need to be about loving people, and, and and so that all gets lost in the process because we we are fighting sometimes with things that were very uncomfortable. I would rather fight than say, oh, there might be room for growth. Or for change, even if I don't have the answer right now, and um, we're not gonna get into the word by word debate that we can get. Is there's a lot of stuff that we, and I'm sorry that we can't. It's um, 8 p.m. But I think we 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 want to create room for conversation, for prayer, for disagreement, but more more than anything, for love, Suzanne. I was just curious if any of these meetings are going to actually, I think um, the deep dive of what Chelsea said the other night, talk about the actual issue of reconciling congregation and what it means. Because I, I feel it's, like we're all, we've already made our decisions coming. about sexuality. Well, so and can you just talking. give them a, like, next week we're doing this. Or so next we week it. we're going to talk about some of the history of the reconciling movements, where you came from, when you started. So that I know that you can do all this research online, but I think it's good for us to talk about mm. like how, the, net, the network itself, right? Not how, just like this progressive movement, no, 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 but the yes. net, so like how, what it means in reconciling. So how? So it's part of the conversation, so that we can get to the point where we make, you know, we understand. But we're gonna have more than one week yes. on how it impacts us yeah, and the consequences of. Yeah. 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 We're gonna get into those so, things, okay. and then so so this, so today, tonight, and tomorrow, we're gonna do this. So this kind of this conversation is going to happen tomorrow in the morning Bible study. Isaac is, is in Europe, mm -hmm. and so he gave us the space to do that. And then next week we're going to do a Monday night conversation about the history of the Reconciling Network in the evening and in the morning. And then the next two weeks we're going to talk about specifics about what it's going to mean for St. Matthews to become a Reconciling congregation. When you say network, are you talking about a network on TV called Refining. No, no, it's a network of, of churches that are... It's about 1,800 churches out of a 32,000 United Methodist Church. They have a website. I urge all of you to check out the website before that conversation so that you can see what the group itself, it has about 41,000 individual members and about 18, between 18 and 1,900 congregations that have identified with them. Okay, and tell me again the name of this website. Reconciling, yeah, reconciling Ministries. I'm going to write it on the board. I'm going to write it on the board. It's RM and, no, RM Network. Um, now that I'm writing, I'm. Yeah, just Google Reconciling. Well, if you look up Reconciling Network or Reconciling Ministries, you'll find it. Yeah. Yeah. I looked up Reconciling RM Congregations, that's all I can do. Right. Either out of Chicago, if I recall. This one. RM. RM. Network. The so Reconciling Ministries Network. Network.
So does this mean that uh, a few generations ago we could have had a reconciling ministry for gender? Right. Uh -huh. Most likely would have been about race. Another yeah, well, well, yeah, one yeah. for race, right, but right. one for women being leaders in the church. Right. Yep. I mean right. that was a or leaders anywhere, and so it, so it's the same kind of thing. Uh -huh. Some would be different subject. Right. Well, the Methodist Church for our generation always like about different right. you know, these changes. In fact. Methodist Church used to build a church here in Bowie until they got rid of their racist policy regarding selling homes. Right. When they were building Corner Ridge Drive, yeah. mm -hmm. that's when they yeah. decided they will sell homes to African Americans, and we said, "Okay, we'll we'll forgive you. We'll it take your land." Law, that's right. It took a federal yeah. law. Exactly yeah. right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Rich, did you want to say something? Did you raise your hand or not? I, we have enough so time. I, <laughs> you know, I, I sat here tonight and I was a little frustrated. I wasn't sure that we really got to a bottom line. I confess I'm an engineer, so I'm looking to put the pieces together and come up with the widget that we're trying to build. Uh, I look around the table and there are 20 or plus of us here. And we each come from a different point of view, and our experience is that point of view. And I think that somewhere along the line, we have to arrive at a common point before we can move forward. Well, uh, I would say mostly yes, but there are still some brothers and sisters within us who want to learn more about it because they're not certain about it. And so I know that there's a lot of commonality well, that's what I thought we were doing tonight. That I didn't come away feeling like we accomplished that. Which part? The, the, you know, understanding what we were trying to accomplish and coming anywhere close to a common point of departure. It took, that wasn't the, the point of tonight. I figured that out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the point you of tonight, come again. The point yeah. of tonight is, is, a, is a, it's a, it's a process for people who need to at least get some ideas about how to interpret theologically and biblically those scriptures that at times are challenging, at least to give them a frame of reference so that they can begin to see and read the scripture in that way. In this particular in particular issue, that's really was the agenda for tonight. When I heard Gary speak, I was reminded of a presentation that I heard once upon a time years ago. The title of which was "We Are What We Are Because Where We We Came From When." Yeah, it's a great presentation. About 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. I would love to find a copy of it. I've lost mine. So anyway, the gist of it is, uh, we, we all, you know, grew up in different locations. We were subjected to different things. My parents went through the Depression, you know, so that had a big influence on me. And, and you know, the thing is, <laughs> I'm retired military, so I saw a few things that I didn't want to see. But it has impacted where I come from. And as I admitted last Sunday, I am not a biblical scholar. Actually, I grew up in an unchurched family, which is, you know, different because I chose yeah. as a young preteen to go find myself a church and join. But that's, that's the different lens that I come from. Yeah. Yeah. And we all have those differences and we need to take those into account. Well, and here's, I'm going to end on this note. That sounds very obvious to us now, but not, that wasn't too long, that was not very long ago, the perspective of how we read the Bible. It's complicated in a lot of ways, but I think we are getting to the point that we're understanding that we bring with us this baggage when we read the scriptures, but there was a point that that was not even acknowledged among a large group of people when they read the scripture and they were taught there is just one way to read the scripture, okay? And if you don't read it that way, you're out, which is kind of what I'm trying to say to all of us, that this is not about biblical authority. 
I think we all respect the authority, beginning with the scripture. It's not about biblical authority. It's about the interpretation of the scriptures. It's about how we read the Bible, and we need to be aware of what you just said. When I read the Bible, who comes with me? So that, is that a good partner or not a good partner? Because not all the partners that we bring are good. So that was the whole point of tonight, to bring us to that place where we can have a better, better tools to at least explain to people you know, why we are where we are. I know you're trying to close, That's but fine. I, I just make one more comment. When I look around at the age of this group, mm -hmm. I think it's interesting mm -hmm. that no one is here, I don't want to say, but I think, except a couple of you, uh, under 50 years old. Now we do have those people, so have those younger people that are really going to grow and produce for this church, are they on board and could just know where they want to be. It's just interesting that none of our young leaders that are leading this church are, are even here tonight. Anyway, it's just there are a lot of reasons that they're busy. They're, you yeah, know, right, right. There's just one parent here tonight. Right. right. It, it, Michelle is with Eli. You know, it's just a lot of well, logistics. I, I understand, but they, we are not running but the church. We're right the now. generations that that are going to have the toughest time yeah. with what's going on. The younger, the younger people have, have grown up with a different perspective. Well, absolutely. My and, we're all you know, crazy. so I, I think <laughs> it's understandable that we're the ones who are screaming for information and, you know, yeah. where do I belong in this and how do I feel about it. Right. And that they've got access to so much more information. Right. I mean, my kids' generation, right. yeah. the 20s, I know there are some of that generation in this church that are finding it very difficult with what's happening Methodist-wise right. globally. Right. Mm -hmm. How could they even get to this point? Yeah, that's right. They yeah. don't understand it because they've grown up exactly. loving everybody. everybody. Right. Yeah. I know right. my kids have been that way. Wow. Right. Mm -hmm. right. You know? I have, I have they're problems. finding it very difficult. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have two copper men who we're not going to do confirmation this year because of the decision that came out of general conference. Right. And they are, um, both of them for different reasons have decided to proceed in the confirmation process. I don't know at the end of this if they're, if they're going to take confirmation vows, right? Um, but, and like it's a question of do we say yes to this church knowing that it is yet a yes to St. Matthew's, right? Because if it's just, if it's a yes to St. Matthew's, it's a yes they can believe in. Right, the love that they've experienced here, they yeah. know where we are as a church, they can say yes to that. And they they said, like, I have no problem coming here. But if I have to, like, promise, which is, like, why I kind of laughed yesterday uh, mm -hmm. in the new members' vows when, like, y'all paused on that question of, like, do you promise to be loyal to the United Methodist Church? And, like, pause for a second just in, like, the uncertainty of if you were supposed to answer it or who was answering the question, yeah, right? Um, like, it is this really uncertain time. And so to ch have, like, these young people committing to being confirmed into this mess right now, like, I mean, it's part of why I'm waiting on ordination, right? Like, I yeah. am waiting until some of this mess resolves, and I'm going to keep fighting in it. But it's, it's real hard to stay in it, right? Like, all the time, I have friends, like, in two weeks, I'm going to go to the ordination of one of my very, very best friends who left the Methodist Church and is now UCC, and I am just, like, so excited to attend this ordination, and also sad. so sad, because he is not United Methodist, and he couldn't be United Methodist because he's gay, right. and he wasn't going to lie, he wasn't going to lie to a board, right. and so it's this, like, crazy time, and yet I think, at least for me, what... I continue to be um, encouraged by is the work that's happening locally, right? Like, it are congregations that are saying, this is, we don't believe in this, and we, like, aren't going to let the larger church speak for us. We're going to speak for ourselves. Um, and clergy who are willing to break the rules and stand up for their queer sibling, right? Like, those moments where, um, I'm reminded that God's not done, and I think our young people are wait are staying in it and are 
also trusting that God's not done with this. But there's a lot of there's a lot at stake right now, right? Um, and we don't know what that is yet. Well, I think you know, that's the point is until general conference comes down and says. But I think a lot of this, like while our conversations of um, passing a welcome statement, going through this process mm -hmm. of becoming reconciling came out of general conference, yeah. this is also a conversation y'all have been having for more than a decade, right? <laughs> y'all have been having this conversation of are we going to officially join this network of churches? Are we not? What is our what is our welcome statement? Are we going to wait for people? Like this conversation has been happening, and I think. We can't wait on, like we we can't wait on what the general church is going to say, because the general church might say one thing in 2020 and then could say a different thing in 2024, right? Could say like each time that conference meets, rules could change and things could move, and so each church has to figure out who like who are we and what are we willing to stand for. And what, like, what are we willing to say, and what are we willing to just, and what are we not going to say, and assume that it's known. Um, and so this process, we're hopeful, is going to help us decide that a little more, right? And so we know that joining a network of churches sounds a little intimidating. Like, what is this thing? And so that's why next week we're going to go into the history that the Reconciling Ministries Network is not new that it's been around for as long as these rules have been in place, this network has been there. Um, and then we'll get into the specifics of, this is how we become a reconciling church, and this is, if we decide yes, this is what it's gonna be. Um, okay, so, what, yeah. I have a question that goes along with that. Sure. As I said last Sunday, in the 80s, I was a member of the Presbyterian Church who went through this and dismembered itself over the issue. There are now two Presbyterian churches. Is that what you see us ending up with? Is two or more, or more Methodist churches? Or more. We said we're not going to talk about it tonight. Come back and find out. We'll lay our woke. No, no, no. Good cliffhanger. No. Yes, there can be two or more. We don't know, but yes, it's definitely, it's definitely gonna happen. Unfortunately, I mean, I know, um, you know. That's what it's looking like. That's what it's right looking now. like. And from I, from all sides. I can people. tell you that, again. This is really the end. We're gonna end here. I can tell you that the vote at the special general conference was a very hard vote, not just because of what it was voted but because it has put the church, even the people who, you know, there are people who say, this is not my issue, it's not, you know, I'm okay, I'm not, you know, but this is not my main issue. But this has forced people to take sides. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. That's not when a we can, thing. When we yeah. can be together now, now that doesn't mean we we're not gonna be welcoming, you know, there are issues still, but all I'm telling you is now, um, you, have a, you have congregations, who are not like you, who are really, really struggling in understanding what their place is in a, in a church, in a larger church. And so we just have to, I guess, be thankful that, that here we are struggling in, our, in a way, but we're also understanding where God is calling. I know Suzanne said it, you know, like, why don't we get to the boat? Ah, keep on. I know, yeah, I just get it over with. But we 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 wanna we wanna give space to finish some conversations. Okay. You wanna say anything? No. Okay. Well, thank you for coming. Get you your poll, Dave. God bless you. Thank you for being part of this conversation. We're gonna do it for three more. I mean, for three more weeks, and. We're very appreciative of all of you being here tonight and for your prayers and for the work that God is doing among us. That's really what matters, what is happening here in this space. That's what matters. What's the date again of, of the conference? Charter? November 16th. November 16th. 9 a.m. But let me, let me say, um,
we're not going to vote that day because we have a new district superintendent and she has a very she's going to do all the, the church conferences and so right after this she has to travel so her time is very limited to do the voting okay so i'm working on her schedule so that we can be in january early january to bring up the vote but it's really more like a logistical issue that we didn't know we, we planned it and then they called us and said why are you scheduling things without talking to the ds i said okay well then, they, <laughs> then we were told that she has to preside she's presiding okay so mm -hmm. is everyone in the con in the church going to vote separately, or just the people that attend that meeting? People that the people attend. that are going to attend the meeting. Just mm -hmm. the only. Well, that's why you have to come. Well, I understand. Uh, yeah. yeah. You know, I'm not sure everybody yeah, else understands. Well, that will have I'm not sure that there. everybody in the church understands what the church conference or charge mm -hmm. conference even is. Mm -hmm. That's why we're going to educate ourselves a little. That's bit. why we need an article in the circuit writer.